for joining us this evening. I'm so glad to see a lot of people in person, and I'm happy that people are joining us online as well. I'm very <coughs> thankful um, to the Nina Library for providing that service for us that we can live stream our programs. And I'm very thankful to Nick Jevney from the Menasha Historical Society in the back. He videotapes our programs, and then we're able to put them on YouTube. So please give Nick a round of applause. I'm Jane Lang. I'm the director of the Nina Historical Society. And again, we're just so happy you're here tonight. We've got a, a wonderful topic tonight I think you'll enjoy. First, I want to just give you a couple of updates about what we'll be doing in the uh, months to come. Um, March 17th, we'll be doing a program that is linked to our current exhibit, which is Tracing Our Paths, Nina's Immigration Stories. If you haven't visited the exhibit yet, please come and visit. It's really fun. We think you'll enjoy it. You'll learn a lot about the immigrants who have made a significant impact on our community. On March 17th, we'll be doing featuring one of the stories in the exhibit and doing the program Nina's Immigration Stories, William Owen, and the Welsh of Wisconsin. I think that presenter is here tonight, actually. So she'll be doing that next month for us. That's Julie Hawkins. And then April 21st, we have a little bit of a change in our program, and that will be uh, that we'll be meeting at the Menasha Library on April 21st to present a program that will be the first in a series of programs we'll be doing called Nina's Pioneers and Settlers. And we'll be first covering the Joseph Jordan story. And Tom Van Leeshout and his brother Jim will be doing that. They are descendants of that man who was the first blacksmith in the state of Wisconsin. So some really interesting and uh, long history and deep history in the state of Wisconsin. So please come to that. But remember, we'll be at the Menasha Library for that. I just wanted to point out um, as well on, at the side table is my assistant, Becky Kwiatowski. And she has some of the books that we'll be talking about tonight and drawing information from. If you want to have a copy of your own, or you can come to the Historical Society, too, to check out a copy if you don't want to purchase one. But um, we're happy to uh, sell you a copy if you'd like one tonight. Also, I mentioned the exhibit that we have. We have a new book. Becky, you want to hold that up? We have a new book on the exhibit. So if you haven't had a chance to visit the exhibit and you'd like to know more about it, you can at least uh, check out a copy of a book on the exhibit. We think you'll really enjoy it. I think that's all I've got for announcements. So we're going to dive right in on our topic tonight. And that topic is the life and the story, the legacy of Theda Clark Peters. It's an amazing story, and I think that you'll be really inspired by it. I find that history is most interesting when you can find stories of people who made a big difference to a community. And I had a hint from um, one of my friends in the audience who said, you know, you should ask, how many people were born at Theta Clark? Show of hands. A lot of us were. So isn't that great? We all share that common history of being born at that hospital that was named for the woman we're talking about tonight. One of the things that I think is very interesting, though, to think about when you're talking about someone's life is to figure out why they became the person they became. Who was influencing them? How did they develop? What was their childhood like? What, what were this person's parents like? What were the influencers in this person's life? So we're going to start because I think this person had a very big influence on his daughter. So Charles B. Clark, you've probably heard that name before. He was born in 1841. He lived a relatively short life. But he was a very industrious young man. He was a Civil War soldier, and we'll get to that in a minute. A business owner, entrepreneur, he served as Nina's mayor, he was a state representative, and a U.S. congressman, but he was also a devoted father to three children. One of the things that he said that has been quoted fairly often 
to his daughter, actually advice on her 16th birthday, was, Theta, the best happiness we get in this world is in making someone other than ourselves most happy. I think that was a great piece of advice he gave her. She took it to heart. As I said, he was a Civil War soldier. He had an outstanding character as an individual. He always put others before himself. And this truly was a trait he instilled in his children. Lieutenant Clark was part of Company I of the 21st Regiment, which formed in 1862. It formed in um, Oshkosh, actually. The soldiers rolled out of Oshkosh on a train in August of 1862. By October, he was in a severe battle in Chaplin Hills, Kentucky, where their regiment suffered heavy losses. He later fought at Chaplin Hills, Kentucky, where, um, I'm sorry, he later fought at, at Chickamauga, which was a, a significant battle in the Civil War. He spent the Christmas of 1863 camped at Lookout Mountain. And I'd like to read just an excerpt from <clears throat> this book, C.D. Clark, His Short Life. This was recently published by um, Don Nussbaum, who is a volunteer at the Historical Society. He actually does all of our photo scanning, um, so we're very grateful to him. We had come across, someone donated a box of letters that had been found in a shed in Nina that had letters that C.B. Clark wrote home to his mother during the Civil War. Um, Don transcribed all of these letters and then wrote this book. He did so much research and it's just an amazing book. If you get a chance to, please look at it. Um, from Don's book, I'm just going to read a short excerpt. The morning of September 11th found the regiment on top of Lookout Mountain. <clears throat> this happened to be on the one year anniversary since the 21st departure from Oshkosh. It's approximate. John Henry Otto reflected back on that day they left for war. Then we counted a thousand stalwart men just dismissed from the doctor's scrutinizing examination and who all thought to be able to stand the rough usages and hardships of war. That illusion had speedily been destroyed. It was a thing of the past. Not one in the regiment now, but who realized that tomorrow may be his last day. Of the thousand men who dined at Oshkosh a year ago, not 500 dined that day on Lookout Mountain. Over 200 had already been assigned to their final resting places in Dixie. A great number were discharged on account of disability and diseases, or were scattered in diverse hospitals. Certainly the Civil War had a significant impact on C.B. Clark and the man he became. Um, I do want to just kind of quickly review his service in the Civil War because it, it started out um, with that difficult time, many battles he fought in. Um, by May of 1864, he was marching with General Sherman towards Atlanta. But this is kind of a, a summary of what had happened up to that point in his group. Seven Company I men had died as prisoners at Andersonville and Danville. Five had deserted, 29 had been killed, and 26 were too wounded to continue. What was finally left of Company I participated in the Grand Review at Washington, D.C. in May of 1865 following Lincoln's assassination on April 15, 1865. This is a letter that C.B. Clark wrote to his mother just a week after Lincoln's assassination. Dear Mother, I find the time once more to write you a letter, not that I have any news to write, but to let you see that I am well and with God's blessing I am prospering. All goes as nice as a marriage bell. All the boys are looking for the time to start for home. Most think it is not far distance, yet I hardly expect to get home before August. Our regiment, as I told you in my last letter, is doing duty here on Cape Fear River. Most of the army is at Raleigh, where General Sherman's headquarters are at this time. All the citizens in these parts are very sick of the war and are glad to stop it in any manner. 
Most of them think it is too bad that President Lincoln was killed. The man who killed him will not get much sympathy from the thinking men of the South. They all say that the rebels' aim is played out, and the United States is a great success. Most all in the South are short for provisions and will be till after harvest. All crops look well, and most all will get enough to take them through next winter. General Sherman is coming down on the army with strict discipline so as to protect the citizens in trying to establish civil law and order. Mother, I wish I could take you through this country so you might see for yourself what war has done. So 1865, C.B. Clark then returned to Nina. This is a photo of downtown Nina in the early 1880s. We don't have any photos from the 1860s of downtown Nina, but I think it looks approximately the same as it may have looked when Charlie Clark returned to town. He went into partnership with a man named H.P. Levins in establishing a very successful hardware store. Then he married a woman named Caroline Hubbard on December 27, 1867, two years after returning home. Their daughter, Theda, was born on February 13, 1871. He founded Kimberly and Clark Corporation with three of his friends in 1872, March of 1872. I don't have quite as much information about Theda Clark's mother, but this is a photo of her, Carrie Hubbard Clark. We did discover that she had been a school teacher in Nina, and she married C.B. Clark, as I said, on December 27, 1867. And theirs was a, a very happy marriage, I'm certain. The four founders of Kimberly and Clark Corporation you may be familiar with. I found this photo in the basement of City Hall. Uh, they have a collection of some very interesting historical items, objects, and photos in the basement there. This photo is about this big, but I think it was something that might have been handed out to um, business associates or people in the community. I love that this one has written on the bottom of it, Compliments of K, C, and Company, February 1876. It was really great to come across that. In the front, seated on the left, is John Alfred Kimberly. On the right, seated, is Avila Babcock. Standing in the back, on the left, is C.B. Clark. And on the right, is F.C. Shattuck. What I thought was very exciting about this particular photo is on the back of it, you could see that it had been taken at the Manville Photography Studio, which is in downtown Nina, right where Knox Furniture is today. But it's fun because all four founders of KC have their signatures on the back. So I can picture them sitting around signing these photos so that they could hand them out to their friends and business associates. Theda's young life was very active in Nina. Her father was obviously very successful. He was a successful businessman growing and expanding Kimberly and Clark Corporation. Casey's first mill was the Badger Globe Mill that was on North Commercial Street in Nina. Originally, they had um, converted a flour mill and then added on to that, but then the Globe Mill was built in 1884. This was Casey's main office building, also on North Commercial Street, built in 1880. This is where C.B. Clark would have been working. This was the Clark's first home on Wisconsin Avenue. It was built in 1875. So this was Theda Clark's childhood home. It was later moved down the street and a new home was constructed that is still there today. I love to think about the family relationships between the different founders of KC and the different neighbors and friends in the community. And this was a book that was donated to the Historical Society some years ago. Inside it, uh, the book is called Belle and the Boys, but inside it 
you see that it's inscribed, A Merry Christmas to Theda Clark from Mr. and Mrs. F.C. Shattuck, 1879. So it would have been a book she received as a Christmas gift when she was eight years old from her next door neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. F.C. Shattuck. So business partners, friends, neighbors, they were all part of this growing community in the 1870s. This is an early photo of Theta, and again, that 16th birthday advice that her father gave her. I think it served as a guiding principle for her for all of her life. <coughs> The Point School is where Theda Clark would have attended in her early um, years of education. She probably attended here from about 1876 to 1880. This school, a uh, one-room schoolhouse, would have been approximately where Linden Court is um, today in Nina, if you're familiar with that, on Doty mm -hmm. Avenue, um, Cedar Street area. Next. She would have attended uh, what was called Lena High School, later called Washington School. Uh, that was built in 1879. It originally was a K through 12 school, so all the grades were attending here. This school um, existed in the location that the current Washington School is located, and it was here until uh, 1976 when it was torn down. Actually, I was the last sixth grade class <laughs> out of Washington School before it was torn down. I remember, that just reminded me, I remember as a kid, uh, they were thinking about, you know, they would tear it down in the summer, and they were starting to remove some of the trees. So we stood at the window, and the windows were giant, as you can see, and we watched some of the really big old trees being taken down because they needed to do that as they were uh, then taking down the, the uh, school itself. This is a picture of Theta's class at Nina High School in 1885. You can see a large number of students there all looking pretty prim and proper. <laughs> and that's a close-up of Theta standing there in the middle. You know, um, another great resource that I use for putting this presentation together is this book, Family Letters, written by Suzanne O'Regan. And this is a wonderful book. It really gives you so much more detail about the things I'm talking about tonight. I'm reading little excerpts, but she uh, put in the full letters and full descriptions. So uh, I highly recommend this book if you want to dig in on this topic further. One of the things, though, that I was thinking about uh, from the perspective of a 13-year-old girl, I think she probably wouldn't have been too excited to know that so many years later her diary would be read aloud. <laughs> but that's what we're going to do, so don't worry, it's nothing too much. <laughs> but I, I think it's fun because it helps you understand how normal and typical her life was even so long ago. So, Tuesday, January 1st, 1884. Today is New Year's, and it's a very gloomy day, storming quite hard. Last Thursday, Lizzie B. had a party. About 36 were there. We had a nice time. L.H. took me to supper. Mark Moulton took Nell Howard home. All the really important details. <laughs> Yesterday, I lent my old-fashioned girls to Hattie Radke. I hope she will take care of it. I am reading My Vassar Girls now. Billy is better today, but does not like to drink the scalded milk, so he has to go hungry. That's her younger baby brother. I have to take care of him, but he is easy to put to sleep. I will try and be a better girl this year and commence today. I've been home all day, except I went over to Mrs. Kimberly's after Callie and stayed about a half hour. This um, next one gives you a little bit of a perspective on how things have changed. Thursday, January 3rd. 
Yesterday I rode downtown behind the buckboard, but was glad enough to get on the back because there was a cow coming behind the hack. <laughs> I went to Mrs. Weber's on an errand for Mama, and nothing would do but that, that I must stay with her and catch on Bob's. We had lots of fun. Cora Giddings gave us a good ride, and so did DeWitt Van Ostrand. After we got through riding like that, we went up on the hill and had some fun. J.S. gave me some lovely rides on my sled. I wonder, you know, is she trying to hide who J.S. is? Or <laughs> I'm not sure. Mr. Matthews was buried yesterday afternoon. Last night, Hattie Kay came over here and brought my book. She stayed and we made some candy. It was so cold today, it seems as if the very smoke would freeze in the air. And Papa would not take his scarf. The sleighing is not worth a cent. Papa was sick last night, but does not let us know it. He will die some night when we don't know it. It was lonesome this PM, so went downtown, did some errands for Mama, then dropped into Nell's to see how she was. I told Nell all the gossip of the season. Then I went to the office, just in time to catch Papa before his coming home. It is still cold as ice. Baby is just dropping off to sleep. So, kind of a normal childhood, but it's fun to hear the details of what life was like in 1884. Mm -hmm. uh, Theta had a big role to play in her family as the big sister in the family. Her sister Callie was born in 1880 when Theta was 9, and C.B. Clark Jr. was born in 1882 when Theta was 11. So she had a lot of responsibility in helping take care of the chicks, as her <laughs> father referred to them. This is a, the full letter uh, that has that quote for her on her 16th birthday that we've referred to before. I think you'll find it interesting. It's, uh, he's starting to write her letters because he's um, serving in the state legislature and then as a congressman, so he's gone from home a lot. February 7th, 1887, so it's almost her birthday. Dear Theta, my dear girl, I can assure you that you will never find one like your mama for a fast friend and one that you will remember the longest day you live. I wish I could be with you on the anniversary of your birth, but I can't be there. I shall think of you often on that day. <clears throat> My dear girl, I shall at, all, shall at all times strive to so conduct myself as to never cause you or the other chicks to regret you have me as your father. Mm -hmm. I want to live every day remembering that it is one less for us to be all together as a family. And let, let us live that we will not regret the conduct on one day but shall be able to look back and say that each one has been so happy that I almost regret that it is gone. Theta, the best happiness we get in this world is in making someone other than ourselves most happy. I shall be so glad to see you and the other chicks. I shall work hard to make it smooth sailing for you all, and I can get the most happiness from so doing, for it makes me so happy to see you have a good time. Love to you all, and a kiss to each one, your father. So to help you understand and give you a little perspective on what Theta's teen years were like, it's kind of interesting to think of what was going on with her father during those years. He had started Kimberly and Clark Corporation when Theta was one. He was the mayor of Nina when she was between the ages of nine and 11. He was a state representative when she was between the ages of 14 and 15 and then a U.S. congressman when she was between the ages of 16 and 19. In 1888, when Theta was 17, she and her good friend, Helen Howard, who lived down the street, enrolled at Wells College in Aurora, New York. Wells College was founded in 1868 and was located in upstate New York. C.B. Clark's own boyhood home was in Teresa, New York, a different part of New York, but still upstate New York, 
So they might have been comfortable with sending their daughter that far away for college. I know that's a challenge for all parents. <laughs> This is a letter that C.B. Clark wrote to her during those um, years when she was in college. This was about one year before he unfortunately passed away. You can kind of tell there's a change in the tone. Now she's a college girl and he's writing to her in a little bit more um, mature way because she's learning things, experiencing new things in college and learning new ideas. So this is September 6, 1890. Dear Theta, your letter at hand for which I thank you. You say that my letters help you. I can't see how. You say that you are going to be a good girl and useful woman. Theta, you must remember that you had a grand good grandmother and that you have one of the best mothers there ever was and you can pattern after them. But that is not enough. For the young women of the times must be more than their mothers, or as men, they must be more. The spirit of the times calls on women for a higher order of things, and the requirements of the women of the future will be great. I think it's very significant that C.B. Clark was such an advocate for women and women's rights. He actually, in the Wisconsin State Legislature, put forth um, a proposal that would have allowed women to have the right to vote well before it actually passed in a, in a national sense. So he was forward thinking and definitely ahead of his time. Very unfortunately, just a year later, Charles Clark passed away. He had some um, health problems throughout his life and it seemed that Theta, even in that diary excerpt, was referring to that. She had maybe some sense that her father wasn't in the best of health. He suffered from Bright's disease, which is a kidney disease. I'm going to read you an, an excerpt from Family Letters. This is how Suzanne O'Regan um, put it. As the long struggle to live was beating out its final clinging heartbeats, C.B. longed to go back to Teresa to see again his boyhood home. And so in 1891, before it was time for Theta to go back to Wells for her senior year, her parents left her in charge of Caroline and Bill. They took the Northwestern to Chicago and changed there for Teresa, New York. In Teresa, while staying at the home of friends, C.B. fell into a fatal diabetic coma. Mrs. Clark sent telegrams to Nina. Theta, Caroline, Bill, F.C. Shattuck, Dr. Barnett, and W.Z. Stewart immediately hurried to his side. Theta arrived in time not to speak to her father, for he was too far gone for that, but in time to put her hand in his one last time. So she was uh, 19 years old when he passed away. The newspaper records so much more in the past than it does today, but very detailed description of his uh, funeral and his uh, the family's arrival to town back to Nina after his death. But this um, short description tells a lot about what he meant to the community. Long before nine o'clock, the appointed hour at which the body might be viewed Sunday morning, saw the people awaiting entrance. Settees had been placed upon the lawn, and upon the opening of the doors, a string of humanity that continued throughout the allotted time filed slowly in and out. It was a varied crowd, men old and young, crippled and erect, women of all classes and ages, and children innumerable, all pressed anxiously forward to get a last long look at the features so familiar to all. Fully 7,000 people viewed the remains. In a small community, that's a big thing. Following his passing, Theta returned back to college to graduate in 1892. This is a picture of her graduation class, a small class of women at this all-women school. 
you can see Theta is the one se seated at the table pouring the tea, handing the teacup. Her friend Helen Howard is seated on the far right. After graduation, Theta moved back to help her mother in the construction of their home. This home is still on Wisconsin Avenue, and you can see it almost as it appeared in this photo. It was built um, in 1892 to 1893. Um, from the notes that I found, it was, uh, I could be wrong, so if anybody knows more accurately, but the notes that I found say that it was the same architect <coughs> as the Pabst Mansion in Milwaukee. So a very beautiful home. They had planned this construction, then C.B. Clark passed away, and so Theta came back from college to help her mother with all of the final details and um, planning and arrangements for creating this beautiful home. January 1st, 1893, here's how they rang in the new year in Nina. Theta is standing in the middle behind the fan, um, friends and family members around her. She obviously enjoyed a very fun and exciting um, social life in Nina and visiting friends in different parts of the country. But I love that we have this. And even has a tiny little uh, descriptor on the bottom. 12.01 a.m. January 1st, 1893. They stay up later than I do. <laughs> Theta's um, early adult years, like I said, were filled with a lot of interesting and exciting things for her. One of the most exciting, no doubt, was meeting her future husband, Will Peters, in 1892. She and her friend Helen Howard were visiting fellow Wells student Helen Karenius in Indiana when they both met their future husbands, Will Peters for Theta and Frank Hawks for Helen Howard. Helen married Frank Hawks shortly after graduation, but Theta and Will had a longer courtship and didn't marry until 1901 when Theta was 30 years old. Almost, I think almost 30 years old. Between college and graduation, a college graduation, rather, and marriage, Theta filled her life with socializing, traveling the country, spending several months in Europe, but most importantly, the business of philanthropy in her hometown. This is one description in the newspaper about a party that was given at their home. A most delightful social event was the dancing party given last evening by Miss Clark and Miss Kelly Clark at the Clark residence. The guests were received upon arrival by the Mrs. Clark and their guests in the drawing room of the elegantly appointed mansion. An immense platform for the dancers had been erected on the lawn near the spacious veranda which adjoins the conservatory, and here to the inimitable music of the Arians, the evening was spent in the enjoyment of the waltz and two-step. I love the descriptions they have in the newspapers. <laughs> This is another um, fun photo of Theta. She's holding the teacup on the far left of no, right of the photo. I believe that's her sister Callie in the back with her arm around the woman next to her. I'm not sure if that's their mother. It's hard to tell. This is D.L. Kimberly is standing in the back and could be um, Dan Kimberly possibly sitting to the left of Theta friends and neighbors and family members. This is a fun photo you might be familiar with. It's a picnic on the lawns between some of the houses on Wisconsin Avenue. You can see Theta seated there with the hat on, on the right-hand side of the table. Next to her is Mrs. D.L. Kimberly, and across the table from her is Miss Mabel Kimberly. At the head of the table at the end, I believe, is um, Havila Babcock. But just um, fun that we have photos to capture some of those just 
fun family times and neighborhood gatherings in Nina in the distant past. Here's a photo of Theda going on her father's boat that was called the Teresa. So gathering with a group of friends to take that boat onto Lake Winnebago. She certainly had a lot of exciting and fun experiences during these years. Um, one of the highlights that we discovered was that she had tea with First Lady Mrs. Grover Cleveland. Another uh, that we were aware of because we had used this story in our previous exhibit, Voting for a Change, on the impact of the 19th Amendment on Nina. Um, she had requested that Jane Adams come to Nina to speak. And Jane Adams was the first woman to win the no Nobel Peace Prize. She was a suffragist and um, activist for women's rights. This letter that she wrote to her um, fiance, I think, is very telling of how exciting that experience was for her. Dear Billy, yes indeed, our day with Miss Adams was one not soon to be forgotten. I felt that I had breathed a breath of true nobility. She is so plain, so simple, unassuming. I had five ladies into lunch to meet her, and all recalled, although she was very retiring and modest, she did talk of her travels, her work, and great things in general. Her English was so pure, she used good, round, mouth-filling Saxon words that expressed much and revealed the pleasant, uplifting channels along which her busy mind travels. Between 30 and 40 ladies and some gentlemen gathered at the Menasha Library to hear her, and it fell to your humble servant to introduce Miss Adams. I was sorry that I could not do it gracefully. I entertained the lady until she departed at 5.40, and as you may imagine, I walked in the clouds. <laughs> so how great for her to have met someone who made a big impact on her, kind of somebody she probably looked up to. Will Peters, um, her fiancé, was part owner of a wallpaper manufacturing firm in Philadelphia. He was from Goshen, Indiana. And really, most of the newspaper accounts that we have been able to find tell more about Theda than they tell about Will, which is unfortunate. It's hard to find more information about him. But his father was a judge, and they were, by all accounts, quite well-to-do. Maybe not quite as well-to-do as Theda was, but a very successful family as well. Here's Theda on their wedding day. Again, the newspaper accounts of her wedding give so much detail down to things you don't even really care about, but <laughs> I will read a little bit. <coughs> of a newspaper excerpt on her wedding as it appeared in the Oshkosh Northwestern. May 15, 1901. William C. Peters of Goshen, Indiana, takes as bride Miss Theda Clark. The event was one of the most elaborate imaginable. The expenditure of wealth left nothing wanting in the way of appointments. Park Row Nina, one of the handsomest and wealthiest of residence streets, witnessed a brilliant and elaborate function Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock when Mr. William Hank Cunningham Peters of Goshen, Indiana, wedded Miss Theda Clark, a prominent <coughs> Nina young lady, heiress to the millions of the late C.B. Clark of the Kimberly and Clark Paper Company. The event was a quiet home wedding, but was nonetheless elaborate because of its quietness. The ceremony was pronounced by Dr. J.E. Chapin, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Nina, in the presence of about 75 relatives and intimate friends. The spacious three-story brick residence on Park Row was profusely decorated for the occasion, and the appointments were elegant and complete as befitting the wealth and esteemed social position of the handsome bride. There was a special telegram sent to the Chicago Chronicle, so this was really big news all throughout the Midwest. Miss Theda Clark, heiress to nearly $2 million, was married tonight to William Cunningham Peters, member of a wallpaper manufacturing firm of Philadelphia and formerly managing editor of the Goshen former manuf sorry, managing 
editor of the Goshen Times. The ceremony was performed at the Clark residence, J.D. Chapin officiating. So they started out their happy lives together. Married life for Theda. Um, she made her home in Goshen, Indiana with her husband, but she kept her strong ties to Nina all during those years. She traveled back and forth from Goshen to Nina and continued to be, as I mentioned earlier, very involved in the philanthropy of contributing to this community and was making a big impact. You have to think about, this is a woman of the age of 30 and how many women at the age of 30 are even thinking much beyond themselves at that age. So I give her a lot of credit for being the woman that she was and contributing in so many big ways to this community. This is a, a short letter that she wrote to her mother during this time, which I think is very indicative of her personality and how she wanted to get things done. She was working hard to get things established in this community. So this is October 29th, 1901. Dear ones, what can you give to this joint project? Answer at once with a quick delivery stamp. Cal, you could give $1,000 and Mama $500. It would not be called for for a year, you know. And then if the double plan fails, we work separately. And I want you to back me on the library. Mr. Shattuck tells me we will have the library. The Bergstroms and all the ladies will back me. This part is kind of funny. Yesterday was a blue day. Mr. Stevens refuses to give one penny to the damned public. <laughs> That's in quotes. C.W. Howard follows his noble example. Mr. Shields thinks that the effort of years are enough and his effort to obtain Carnegie's $10,000, so he will give $10. Isn't that heartrending? <laughs> Mr. Whiting is considering. Also Mr. Van Ostrand. We will go again this a.m. to the Gilberts and Mr. Kerwin, also Will Davis. Last evening, the merchants, brewers, and saloon men met. Only 26 out of the 60 they expected appeared. Among 10 of them, $975 was raised. It looks dubious for the amusement hall, although we work night and day. So two of her significant projects that she made happen in Nina were the Opera House, which um, was formerly on Wisconsin Avenue, and the Nina Library. This was the original Nina Library, which unfortunately didn't open until after her passing in 1904. I think that when you consider what she was trying to invest in in the community, one of the things that might have motivated her to even be contemplating a hospital, perhaps, was the fact that she had witnessed a lot of hardship and death and difficulty due to health concerns amongst her community. Her next door neighbor, D.L. Kimberly, had died in 1892 of back surgery performed in his home. Mm -hmm. Her own father had died of Bright's disease in 1892. In 1902, Frank Shattuck, one of the four founders of, and partners in Kimberly and Clark, died of a ruptured appendix. There was no hospital and very minimal health care in Nina. So while Will was very busy traveling for business, making a living for the two of them, Theda often returned home, stayed with her mother, and worked on these projects. This was a letter that Theda wrote to her husband on May 22, 1903. My dear, I had such a sad letter today from Martha telling me that Molly Williams, the dearest girl, had died giving birth to a nine pound boy and the little boy went away with her in her arms. It was such a shock to me. Martha never would have written had she known that I am so apprehensive. Your devoted wife, Theda. 
Many women died in childbirth in those days. And the reason for her apprehension was she, too, was now expecting their first child to be born in October of that year. This is from Family Letters. On August 13, 1903, 68 days before her death, Theta had her will drawn up. Here she made provision for her husband, her child, and for charity. Here she gave directions as to how her estate was to be handled in the event of her death. It was the money left in this will that made Theta Clark Hospital impossible. The day arrived, October 18, 1903. Dear Julia, this is her sister Carrie writing to their aunt. Just a line to say we have a dear little girl born at half past one today, weighed seven and a half pounds. Theta was sick 48 hours and began to think she was going to have a serious time. She took chloroform and the baby was taken with instruments. Much love, Carrie. Tuesday, dear Julia, Theta has taken a turn for the worse loss of blood and exhaustion. Poor girl, how dreadful if she has to die. Lovingly, Carrie, the baby cries all the time. The next day, uh, October 20th, 1903, the headline was, Angel of Death Takes One of Nina's Fairest and Loveliest. Again, there's much more detail in the book family letters, but I'll just read the beginning of that obituary. Our people were shocked last evening by the sad report which none could at first fully believe, but which alas proved too true, that Mrs. W.C. Peters of Goshen, Indiana, had died at the home of her mother, Mrs. C.B. Clark, from hemorrhage. The news carried sadness to nearly every home in Nina, for all of our people knew Mrs. Peters, formerly Miss Theta Clark, and those who knew her best loved her most, as hers was a noble nature, womanly, charitable, kind and liberal, and full of sunshine. The story doesn't end there. This is Theta Clark Peters Smith, her daughter who was born that day. This is a letter that Theta wrote in July before she gave birth to her daughter as a letter to be read in the event of her death. So her husband opened and read this letter. July 13, 1903. My husband, I hope that I am leaving you the greatest treasure that a woman can give her husband, a child, a son or daughter to cling to you and love you as long as you shall live. Teach our child to know me as a mother somehow. Teach our child so much of good that the evil of life can find no place in its heart or head. Teach our child to appreciate what is given it, done for it. Be with our child, travel with it, give it every advantage of knowing culture and refinement. Let my mother see and be with our child often. She loves children and should you leave the child ever, send it to her that she may bring it up. It seems as if I could not leave you, but that is not for us to decide. I shall wait for you and try to watch over you somewhere. Your wife, Vida. Picture of young Vida Peters. Riding the bike, her grandmothers. The will that uh, we mentioned before that she had written up, gave instructions to her brother specifically to donate money to build a hospital in the city of Nina. And he carried out those plans. She donated $96,000, that's $2.7 million in 2020 dollars to build the hospital. Um, C.B. Clark Jr., or Bill as he was called, followed through with those plans and built the hospital in his sister's memory. And also an additional $50,000 was given to pay for those who couldn't afford care. 
Construction began on the Theda Clark Memorial Hospital and it opened in 1909, six years after Theda's death. I love this picture because you can see the shadow of the photographer in the foreground <laughs> holding probably one of those blankets over a big old camera. And then also just notice what tools they had for building that hospital and what they brought the materials on horse drawn wagons, so quite an accomplishment. We have an early booklet on the hospital that was published in 1911 that has great photos and information on the hospital's features and their statistics from their services that were performed there in their first year of operation, which would have been 1910. This is the operating room, the waiting room, and a typical patient's room, private room with bath. I found this um, article recently about the hospital's opening. This is kind of interesting. I hadn't ever really heard this description of the hospital, but the one um, thing that it really wanted to focus on was the hospital is perfectly noiseless. <laughs> the Theta Clark Hospital at Nina was opened last Sunday to visitors. This hospital has been built without regard to expense, and it represents the very latest thought and practice in hospital construction and equipment. It will be of local interest to mention that the provisions have been taken to prevent nerve-wracking sounds, particularly the tormenting clamor of call bells from the patients' rooms at all hours. <laughs> the floors of the Theta Clark Hospital do not permit the sound of a footfall to be heard, and there are no bells whatever. Instead of call bells, an electric call runs from the patients' beds to a sort of switchboard in the hall where an attendant is stationed, and the patient's call is represented by the lighting of certain electric lamp corresponding to that patient's room, which remains lighted until turned off by the nurse responding to the call. Such things as these ought to be part of the equipment of every hospital. <laughs> so they were very proud of their noiseless hospital. I'm not sure if you can make this out, um, but it's interesting to note, in 1910, the general ward cost was $10 per week to stay at the hospital. Um, obstetric fee, $3. <laughs> A private room, however, was $12 to $15 per week. So, <laughs> This is a report of the cases that were treated at the hospital during the year 1910. Total number of patients admitted, 216. Surgical patients, 110. Medical patients, 94. Obstetrical patients, 12. And then there's a breakdown of all of the different um, ailments that were being treated. This is an early view of the completed hospital as it opened in 1909. It's quite a beautiful hospital. Theta Clark also opened a nursing school in 1912. Its first graduates were in 1915, and it continued in operation until 1938, graduating 126 nurses, who I'm sure had a big impact on the community and surrounding area. There have been many additions to the hospital over the years. This, you can see um, one of those in this postcard. This is a view in 1974, looking from the Nina Harbor across to the hospital. <clears throat> this is the hospital when it still was known as Theta Clark Hospital. And this is a more modern picture of Theta Care Regional Medical Center and Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. I'd like to give you a couple of facts about uh, the hospital from the 2020 Community Benefit Report. There are now over 180 total locations for Theta Care, over 7,000 employees, 1,100 providers, over 2,000 nurses, over 60 specialties, seven hospitals are included, and 250,000 patients are annually served. 
So amazing to think how it started and what it's become. Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled that Theta Clark Hospital, Theta Care, is staying in the community. Mm -hmm. We recently approved uh, plans for them to build an addition onto the hospital to house an extensive um, improvement of their emergency department, along with many other um, improvements as well. One of the things I thought was most exciting is the fact that they'll have many more teaching opportunities at Theta Care um, now in this facility. So very excited and happy that they are remaining part of our community. This is Theta Clark's tombstone in Oak Hill Cemetery in Nina, out on Main Street. And on it is inscribed in Latin, which I won't try to read. Um, the translation is to have and to distribute. And I think that really sums it up for Theta Clark and her short life, the impact that she had on this community in so many positive ways. She's inspirational, and I hope that you've learned a little bit more about her tonight that will inspire you to make a difference in this community. Thank you. Do you have time for a question? Sure. Um, I'm not sure I can answer, but... I'm a lifelong resident of Mina, as many of you are, and I'm a little, a little curious about the pronunciation of T-H-E-D-A. I mean, as far back as I can remember, it was Theda Clark. Yep. Yes. And lately, it seemed like since Theda Care came into existence, I'm hearing a lot of Theda Care, Theda Care. Mm -hmm. And it kind of sticks in my craw. It shouldn't yeah. be Theda. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> I, the name is pronounced Theda, but I think over time, and I can even remember as a kid too, once in a while I would hear Theta, and I wasn't quite sure which it was, but um, my mom made sure that I knew it was pronounced Theta. <laughs> um, the Opera House, do you know where on Wisconsin Avenue it was located? It was located where the towers are in that block. Okay. Anything else? When, when did her mother pass? Actually, I looked that up. Did she live longer than her mother? Yes, she did. And then she lived in, in that house in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and where did uh, Theta's daughter, did she live with Theta's mom? <laughs> um, well, I can tell you, Miss, Mrs. Um, C.B. Clark passed away in 1922, so quite a few years after her daughter had passed away. If you're interested, I have a copy of her obituary. I have a copy of Mrs. Lita Peter Smith's obituary as well. So if you'd like to come up and take a look at that afterwards, you'll learn a lot more. Her, her daughter married uh, Smith. From uh, Menasha Woodenware. Yes. And they had uh, five kids uh, that her daughter had. Mm -hmm. Carlton. Carlton, Oliver, and Lawrence. Carlton. I have um, William Peters' um, obituary as well up here, so you might want to take a look at that. It, it's interesting to note that um, he passed away when Theta was still quite young, Theta Peter Smith. So she lost her mother before, you know, she knew her and she lost her father when she was relatively young, too. Do you know if her husband ever remarried? No. As far as I know, no. Oh. <laughs> yes. In two weeks from today, the speaker will be celebrating. And I thought before we leave tonight, we could all join together <laughs> and say a happy birthday to Jane. One, to you. two, and three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.